Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the GSAP Incubator Spring presentation. My name is Agustin Shang. I'm the program manager at this GSAP initiative. We're very excited to be at town at the school this year, presenting and discussing the work our members have been undertaking during the fourth year of this platform. The GSAP Incubator, founded in 2014, is an initiative that provides recent graduates with a collaborative environment to explore and develop their new ideas and projects at the intersection of culture, technology, and the city. It blends a professional setting and a culture of entrepreneurship with a communal, creative energy and rigorous score experienced by students during their time at TSAP. The program expands the territory between academia and the profession, and it allows members to share experiences and skills while building the professional network and connecting to critical issues in New York and beyond. We are located at the heart of downtown, Credit Scene, at 231 Bowery. The CISAB Incubator is an anchor tenant of New Inc. Funded by the New Museum in 2013, New Inc. is the first museum-led cultural incubator for art, technology, and design. As a unique university-led initiative, CISAB Incubator spans multiple disciplines that draw on the strength of the school, its faculty, its vast alumni network, the resources of the New Museum, and New Inc., and the proximity of Lower Manhattan's creative and technology industry. What you have seen on the screen is just a brief record of the series of projects, initiatives, and events that orbit around the GSAP Incubator's individual practices. All of them, consequences of multiple interaction, and as a result of organic developing in an incredible dynamic setting. Credit conversations, book lunches, office hours, panels, professional workshops, group therapies, mini maxi lecture series, network one events, tours, visit, happy hours, all of these operate in a specific location of site to school. I want to thank everybody who helped and is helping to make the GSAP Incubator a rare, unique, and exciting space where we all can develop methods and practice through trial and error, explore new endeavors without depression or financial success, be interested in innovation, and at the same time apply technology and critique the newness, work together at the intersection of an educational institution at GSAP a cultural institution at the New Museum, and a neighborhood of the flow with creativity, arts, and culture. But what I really, really want to highlight, especially on this time of today, is how GSAP and the GSAP Incubator provide a space and a platform where we all can participate. The possibility of belonging to a place, a safe, physical, intellectual environment, where radical configurations of private practice, research, events, and public engagement could not only coexist and in fact can occur all at the same time, fostering, impacting, promoting, and expanding cultural value in architecture and the city. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We have a huge lineup today. I think we have 16 amazing practitioners presenting the work. We're going to go fast, um, so we should start. For the presenters, speak on the phone so you get recorder. Uh, I'm gonna be timing for a minute. I'm sorry. Um, hi, I'm Ashley. This is Ariana and Andrea. We graduated from the MARC program last year and started A plus A plus A out of the incubator. So our practice is based in New York, but we come from an array of cultural backgrounds. We started with an interest in collaborative practice that would allow us to create projects with other designers, but also projects we felt would have a larger social impact and offer the opportunity to work directly with local communities. Early projects included workshops with food office hours in Chinatown, design charrettes at New Inc. with other designers and our friends, and pop-up gallery shows. This served as a foundation for us to continue defining how we want to work and build our practice. In the meantime, we've been developing a larger self-initiated project uh, in Immokalee, Florida, called Rural Assembly. Uh, it's a community-driven affordable housing project for farm workers. What started as a research proposal about affordable housing across rural America at the end of our time at GSAF grew into a way to test our approach to design in a real-world scenario. We began Rural Assembly by approaching different nonprofits in Florida with a vested interest in housing. After getting connected with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, 
we were able to host workshops that creatively encouraged farm workers to talk about housing issues and imagine an ideal home. Through these community ties and our subsequent partnership with the Immokalee Fair Housing Alliance, the project has evolved beyond research into a schematic housing proposal on a 10-acre site. Our role evolves from hosting workshops with the farm workers and developing program requirements with the Housing Alliance to developing an initial design proposal to assist with fundraising. We hope to continue this method of working hand in hand with the community and Immokalee as the project moves forward. What we realized through working in rural assemblies that our value lies in uh, the process of, engage uh, of community engagement and as facilitators between communities and the building industry. So this understanding, we've organized our practice into a Pose Pose, which is a science studio, and blank assembly, which is a science consultant. The idea is that they feed into each other. Facilitating community engagement can offer design solutions with a variety of timelines and scales of impact from the creation of ideas to the creation of physical architecture, but without the um, pressures of working within a traditional model. Thanks to the opportunities presented at the incubator, we've created a network of, and thanks to Augustine's uh, guidance, obviously, we've created a network of advisors and collaborators, nonprofits, and even uh, builders and developers. Um, through our time there, we've been able to develop a more clear idea of what our practice is and what we hope to continue to do in the future. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm speaking into the microphone. Um, I'm Caitlin Blanchfield and... I'm Faz and Lutz <laughs> um, And So we're presenting some work we've been doing together um, at the GSAP Incubator. I graduated from the CCCP program in 2014 and I'm actually still a GSAP student um, in the PhD uh, program right now. Um, and then I graduated from AAD in 2012. Um, yeah. So what we've been working on is a project called Modern Management Methods, uh, which is a research and exhibition project that um, has spanned several years in several sites, but the most recent iteration of which will be um, an exhibition at The Shed uh, this summer. So it was really fortuitous that when we were accepted to be part of the incubator, we also uh, were accepted as uh, open call fellows for The Shed's inaugural programming. Um, and so this is us on site uh, doing our project. And Modern Management Methods is a project that um, through research and through uh, innovative imaging technology examines the historical narratives of modern architecture and the ways that buildings have been preserved and the values codified in those processes of preservation. Uh, so initially we did a project in Weisenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart, Germany. And this most recent iteration is looking at the United Nations headquarters um, here in New York City. And so this is us on site x-raying the building, um, and we're working with SOE Studio, who are also uh, incubator members, and you'll be hearing from. So one thing that's been really great about the incubator has actually been this opportunity to kind of forge collaborations um, and new working relationships. Um, and we've also had the privilege of sharing some of this research uh, at the Fitch Colloquium here at GSAP, uh, working with, or thanks to Jorge Otero Pilos, and we're also in conversation with David Benjamin, who I think is here. So GSAP has also provided this really nice platform to, to talk about the work. Um, and so here we are, exploring the speaker's podium at the United Nations building. Um, and again, looking for moments within this architecture that the X-ray allows us to see that speak to the processes of its uh, reconstruction from 2008 to 2014, uh, and the stories of international modernism and new regimes of security, accessibility, um, and internationalism that are kind of baked into that process. Uh, we've also been lucky that uh, through uh, 
through our kind of the ecosystem of the Columbia community, uh, when we finished the first part of the uh, project from Stuttgart, uh, the results of that were seen by the Office for Publications here. And so we're now also working on a book project that is going to be released in uh, in summer. And so that is going to compile uh, both of the surveys we've been doing on Stuttgart and also on the United Nations headquarters and has contributions uh, from various authors as well. Uh, and so the project kind of entails us wearing different types of lead aprons. Um, here we are in the uh, in the Weissenhaus Sidlone, Le Corbusier, UNESCO World Heritage listed uh, property uh, with a portable x-ray machine. Our project is both looking and trying to reveal moments in the building after it's undergone reconstruction where new technology and new ideologies have been inserted into historic fabric. So we're kind of looking for that, but it's also a sort of an aesthetic uh, investigation. So our requirements as an architect and a historian is to uh, try to create really high resolution images uh, of, of, I know, this, of this modern building. So as we're trying to get this high resolution, we found ourselves having to turn more towards medical imaging and to borrow techniques uh, from that industry. And in this case, we're borrowing an x-ray from a horse dentist. Uh, and so this is the results of the x-rays from Stuttgart and the moments and the things that we're looking at. Uh, and you know we're really pumped that in June we're going to be here in the shed and we've also been working with Michael Adlerstein from the Historic Preservation Program who's kind of put us in touch with everyone at the UN. Uh, so you know we look forward to celebrating the results with you uh, June 18th. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cristina Governor Pesudo. I'm a founding partner of uh, Industries Architectural Agonism. And while my office is somewhere else doing more orthodox uh, uh, work of architecture that is uh, building per se now a uh, library in, in Milano, I have uh, tested different uh, formats and different issues as well in my coming back to New York and also in my stay in, uh, at, the, at the New Inc. in the New Museum. Uh, and I'm going to summarize it into four projects and four terms as well. The first term being performative. Uh, the first project is epic architecture. Epic architecture takes inspiration in Bertolt Brecht epic uh, theater and tries to engage architects in issues that have to do with uh, politics, society, uh, ecology, etc. through two different formats. The, fir the first format being uh, a epic architecture um, theater company that is a company that had been uh, doing shows in two continents and had 40 members so far and uh, that had written plays, uh, uh, stage and performed them in a few cities already. And also through design, uh, I have just finished uh, a proposal uh, to make an architectural device that would produce and stage these kind of shows as well through the, the streets of Milan, and that uh, it will be called uh, La Machina Civica. The second, the second term and project, uh, it's uh, through the term investigative, it's uh, the Book of Scenes. The Book of Scenes uh, is a typological study of architecture that had been forgotten uh, by the discipline because it's very bad reputation as uh, architecture that had to do with the seven deadly scenes, greed, lust, etc. Uh, I have also investigated this issue through two formats, a series of uh, advanced studios here in this house and in other universities as well, and also on site in deep field work. Here, here is an investigation on uh, love hotels in, uh, in uh, Tokyo, and now I'm doing the same in New York as well. Oops. Yeah, okay. The third term is uh, collaborative. Uh, this is a project that is not mine. Uh, it's an artist that it's, uh, her name is Stalisnava Pichnuk. Uh, the name of the project is Border, a magnetic field, and she went to Calais, that it was this uh, immigration or refugee camp, as you know, in the border of, uh, of uh, France. Uh, many people gathered there, thousands of people uh, trying to cross to the United, uh, to UK. And you know, um, the French government burned it literally and drowned it, and she went there and gathered uh, all these kinds of objects, patron, cable ties, electric cables, uh, kigos, uh, SMA cards, uh, ten poles, and all these kinds of things, and she did with those 20 kilos of stuff, these very architectural elements, this terrazzo, 
And she's producing a book about the whole process uh, in Paris, and I'm collaborating with her in the book. And we are actually going to present the book as well uh, at the new museum at the New Inc. in June. And finally, the, the term would be uh, theoretical. And uh, last summer, I joined the European Graduate School. The European Graduate School is a university that is in Switzerland. I uh, started a second PhD in uh, uh, philosophy, uh, critical studies, and art. And this is like uh, it's a space that they call themselves an intellectual society with uh, people like uh, Slavoj Žižek, Judith Butler, Angela Davis, and Louis Nancy, and all these kinds of people. And I'm making a test and writing a dissertation and a book about the idea of rejection and absence uh, in architecture as a trigger for discovery, uh, because I think that now in a world that is uh, exhausting its resources, and now in a moment and in a culture that acts as if we were in constant and permanent growth, maybe what we need to do is exactly the opposite and use rejections and absence and negation as a tool for discovery. And actually this term has been very uh, much exhausted in literature and art, but uh, it has all this taboo in architecture as well. Thank you. Hello everyone, thanks for being here. I'm Valerie. While at GSAP, I pursued a master in architecture and co-founded a collective focused on entrepreneurship and design called A-Frame. My name is Lily Kwong and I majored in urban studies at Columbia College. I run a landscape design practice specialized in site-specific botanical installations. Hi, I'm Julia Cho. I studied historic preservation at GSAP before I got PhD in cognitive psychology also at Columbia. I've been looking for evidence of links between spaces and the human cognitions and emotions. At the GSEP incubator at New Inc., we formed a cross-functional team and called it DUO. Joining our various expertise, we became interested in studying people's emotional interaction with nature in urban space. I had a botanical installation at Cadillac House called Summer in Winter. The installation consisted of a high density of exotic plants, creating a jungle ecosystem of sorts. It featured over a hundred different species and over a thousand plants. To access Lily's plant installation, visitors must first channel down an aisle displaying an array of shining Cadillac cars placed between columns covered in digital screens mirrors, and neon lights. Amid this disorienting ricochet of flashes, visitors are invited to engage with the very different atmosphere of Lily's lush green space. The contrast provided a unique opportunity to study the impact of the transition on psychology and physiology. We decided to design a pilot project to guide our investigation. The traditional paradigm of study takes place in a science laboratory. Participants are often shown static images of urban or natural spaces and asked to self-report their experiences. We were interested in bringing the experiment outside the laboratory. We researched various metrics and narrowed possibilities with a wristwatch sensor collecting physiological data, including skin conductance, a well-tested emotional indicator. We geared participants with a chest-mounted camera and asked them to gesture and point to the interesting feature during the visit. We asked participants to take a walk from the launch showroom to the plan area and back to the launch showroom. We also assessed their self-reported emotions before and after the walk. We recruited 14 participants through Lily's Instagram platform. Over the course of four weeks, we had close observation of each participant's interaction with different spaces at Cadillac House. Our findings verify the idea that each of us makes sense of the world differently. Here we extracted a small portion of data from two very different participants, X and Y. Their contrasting psychophysiological data is a testimony to the individual difference from their attention and the memory. For example, someone with a background and skills in architecture design pays more attention to contemporary architecture, might show many spikes in the showroom area. Someone who grew up in a tropical island, the visual contact with certain plants, though exotic to others, might trigger a familiar theme from the childhood memory, therefore many spikes in the plain area. In their post-work interview, 
Both reported having enjoyed the visit and found the planned area most peaceful and comfortable. However, the skin conductance data illustrates a granularity of emotion than mere verbal report. This granularity would help researchers and designers validate how individuals adapt and develop new judgments in response to biophilic or natural stimuli in urban spaces. This matrix displays how the data could be visualized to provide feedback. It displays history and prediction at the individual and the collective levels. At the individual scale, this visualization could enable personalized emotional learning. With a large data set, artificial intelligence and machine learning could enable the visualization of a heat map that predicts how people are going to feel in certain spaces. Imagine a software that provides scientific feedback on how specific design gestures make people feel. This could be particularly useful for decision making in large scale urban interventions. We could even imagine a future in which nature, paired with swarm intelligence, could respond to individual psychophysiological states. Urs Fischer could maybe take up the challenge with a gallery installation. Hi, uh, my name is Gam. Uh, my project at the GSEP incubator over the past year has been basically about trying to answer this question through uh, several projects. Uh, to start, um, this was a uh, study of uh, Myanmar, Burma's new capital city, uh, basically using uh, a technique of extracting roadways to analyze um, kind of an urban regime of control and uh, power, and also the aesthetics of what that control might look like. Uh, this was funded by um, a Kinney grant from Columbia GSAP after I graduated. Uh, it was also published in the Avery Review, uh, which is also run by Columbia. Uh, most of my time at the incubator has been spent uh, working on a project called Territories of Territory Extraction. Uh, this project seeks to uh, draw the geopolitics of Singapore's sand mining and sand importation regime through uh, various means. Uh, for instance, looking at deforestation in Batam Island, Indonesia. So this is a chronological study of uh, the growing areas of uh, sand mining to kind of open cut uh, locations on this particular island. Uh, and then feeding those kind of drawing techniques back into looking at the landmass of Singapore itself and creating a series of these kind of territorial wireframes which are uh, generated uh, from satellite imagery. Uh, they create a kind of a false topography. Uh, those are color coded by time. Overlaid. So, for example, this is about uh, the last uh, 16 years or so. Uh, yellow being territory added in the 2010s, blue area added in the 2000s. Um, yeah, another one. And this is all culminating in a uh, project that I'll be starting uh, this uh, fall at the Ohio State University as the uh, Knowlton Emerging Practitioner Fellow. Uh, called the Great Lakes Drawing Agency, which is seeking to explore the uh, megalopolis of the Great Lakes watershed, which is the area here, um, and using uh, the legal framework of uh, environmental protection to establish uh, a kind of remapping of the public sphere based on water as a resource. And so I like close by saying thank you to Augustine uh, and uh, David for the time. Um, it was really fantastic being at New Inc. this past year. Um, especially thank you to those of you who sat through me trying to workshop this presentation uh, for like four hours. <laughs> it was uh, really great. So, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Steve Sanchez, and I graduated from the real estate program in 2016 um, with a focus on hotel and resort development. For the past year at the incubator, I've been working on a new hotel project called Groundhog Retreats. Long ago, artists and writers started building colonies in remote locations after intuitively figuring out that nature is good for the brain. Now, a lot of evidence-based research proves that right. Research shows that when people are immersed in natural surroundings, they're more creative, they're more productive, 
They share less signs of stress and become better problem solvers. Granha retreats are inspired by these artist colonies, but designed to re-energize and refocus all types of urban knowledge workers. They are places where individuals and small teams can escape from distractions back at home and back at the office, do some deep thinking, and get real work done. Our first retreat will be right in the middle of New York's Catskill Mountains, about a two-hour drive from here. We're renovating an existing inn and spa, and the name Granja is inspired by its historical name, La Granja, the farm in Spanish. Most people are familiar with the history of Jewish resorts in the Catskills, but as a Spaniard, I was surprised to learn that by the 1940s, there were about 20 little villas and retreats that cater to Spanish-speaking New Yorkers. The existing inn sits on 31 acres, and it faces the Asopus Creek and protected forest lands. Just upstream, the creek forks into two and creates a private island that belongs to the property. This is where we plan to um, build Wi-Fi enabled workspaces in cabins and tree houses. One of the main reasons we chose this location is because it's on a main county road and has access to commercial grade internet speeds. The inn has 34 bedrooms and approximately 25,000 square feet. It really has good bones with a yoga studio, fitness center, pool, tennis court, and common areas and restaurants we, we can adapt to our uses. For downtime, we'll improve its fitness amenities and, of course, offer plenty of outdoor activities such as hiking, skiing, fly fishing, and river tubing. Using principles of activity-based office design, we'll offer different workspaces for different work modes. For individual work, desks in each hotel room, a quiet library, and cabins in the woods. For collaboration, meeting rooms, co-working areas, a treehouse office, and video conferencing booths. For socializing and community building, we'll have plenty of eating, drinking, and hangout spots. And of course, outdoor patios, fields, and forests work great for all of these purposes. We're also creating programming focused on productivity, cognitive performance, digital min minimalism, and well-being. From pre-arrival to checkout, we'll provide content such as goal-setting tools and workflow routines guests can use during the stay and hopefully apply to their everyday lives back at home. If it all goes well, we'll close on the property this summer and finish the renovation next year. Once we're open, we'll welcome freelancers, entrepreneurs, and startup teams to visit. We're also looking to partner with New York's best companies to work for to provide their employees access to Granha as a unique workplace benefit that enhances employee experience and demonstrates the company's commitment to work-life balance and human-centric practices. With today's tools and technology, great work can be done anywhere and companies are being redesigned to accommodate the complexities of modern life, while co-working and flexible office space providers are already disrupting commercial real estate markets. I see opportunities outside city, li city limits to create new spaces that satisfy the workforce of the future. Thanks. No, no, it is? Okay. <laughs> okay, hello, I'm Karen Kuby, and I was first introduced to the potentials that architecture has for addressing health equity through my work running New Housing New York, the city's first competition for affordable and sustainable housing, which resulted in this project Via Verde, which is a showcase for how design can promote um, better health and healthier living. Um, currently, most of my work, work, my work work, is with city agencies on projects connecting architecture and health, like this one, which is called Mental Health by Design, where we went into 15 high-need high schools and turned disused spaces into various wellness environments. This project is by Peterson Rich Office. I also have worked with the city on a number of publications in this vein. Um, these are three with the Public Design Commission, Department for the Aging, and the Department of Health. Um, right before I started the incubator, uh, I, my first book came out. So this is Housing as Intervention, 
Architecture Towards Social Equity. This is a 17 essay volume of architectural design, the British publication, um, which examines how housing projects and the design processes behind them might be interventions toward greater social equity. And I was super happy um, that we've been getting some recognition. Um, so then I've been at the incubator and I've also been elsewhere. So since this book came out, I've been on the road a little bit. And um, these represent talks and also research and some amazing synergies. I'm thinking about in Mexico City was especially amazing because Hillary Stample's um, housing conference here had amazing architects um, from Mexico City who I then visited while I was there, including people working with Infonavit, their version of HUD. So this was going to be the moment in the um, presentation. Well, I'll still talk about this part. So I think what's amazing, one thing that's super amazing about being we able to work with Augustine, and thank you very much to David and to Amal um, for um, for this opportunity. But I think what's amazing is you know being pushed to take risks and to apply for way more things than I normally would. So I was going to take this moment to like put some spin on getting comfortable with rejection. But um, I just got this big grant two days ago. Um, so, and um, in about two weeks, I'll be able to tell you which grant I got. It's a secret right now. But I'm super excited. Um, this is a really great book that's very old. This is a great book from 1997. Um, and it was a comprehensive book of case studies on affordable housing. We haven't had a really, really good one in over 20 years, so I'm going to make it. And um, the writers gave me their blessing, so that's coming up. Um, another thing that's coming up is the culmination of my time at the incubator. Um, visualizing health equity contributes visions for an equitable future where every New Yorker has the opportunity to lead a healthier life. A half-day workshop resulting in a publication, the program explores potential impacts at the interdependent scales of the individual, the building, the neighborhood, and the city. And thinking about the publication, I'm inspired by the Buell Center's work um, 10 years ago. Um, so in general, while in residence at the GSEP incubator, I am further developing my practice toward the goal of ending racial and economic disparities in health in New York City. Amidst appalling health disparities and dwindling public support for well-designed housing, I can think of no more urgent issue in architecture than asserting our discipline's value in the realm of public health. There's currently a nine-year difference in life expectancies between East Harlem and the Upper East Side. This must end. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Cristobal, one of the members of the architecture collective NICNOT. We're very sorry that we cannot be here today, so we have prepared a very brief presentation instead. I would like to begin by discussing the notion of the commons, which has been a continuous concern for our practice. If the idea of a common good has historically referred to those resources that are not one's property, but that are available to all, today this term has been reclaimed in different ways by various disciplines. It is discussed in economic, social, and political theory, as well as in architecture, where it is more related to the more traditional ideas of the public real. Our collective contributes to all these existing discussions by addressing architectures of commonality through a procedural perspective. That is, by highlighting the labor practices, legal frameworks, and participatory techniques that articulate an architectural project. In 2017, a school that we built in Nicaragua in collaboration with a local NGO enabled us to put these ideas into practice. This school tested the idea of the commons in two ways. First, through an Indigo campaign that brought together a diverse set of people from over 30 different countries to provide the necessary funding for the school, and that also encouraged some to participate through alternative ways, such as providing legal or technical advice. And second, because we chose a construction method that had to be designed and built collectively. This was a form of building that required great collective effort, but no expensive power tools or highly technical expertise, the airbag system. The airbag system is a construction technique that until recently has mostly been used for emergency infrastructures and self-built. It originated as a technique to build protective barriers for flood control, and in the 70s began to be used by the United Nations in some of their developing programs. However, its organizational, aesthetic, technical, and environmental potential have not yet been developed. So in the school that we built in Nicaragua, we responded to some of these questions. 
We collaborated with engineers to improve the structural integrity of the system. We explore new aesthetic possibilities and we organize design workshops with the community to include them as active participants in the process. This school was the first step of a larger project that looks into the question of how to transform a back of earth into a form of building that has collective interest. The second instance of this exploration happened about a year ago with our runner-up proposal for a pavilion in Governors Island, in which the earth back was applied to New York City public spaces. This was a zero waste pavilion that was to be collectively built during the summer and then collectively dismantled into the island's landscape. So currently we're working on a series of prototypes that continue testing the earthbag system as a catalyst for the commons. Playgrounds that take advantage of the material's plasticity, creating geometries and spaces that could be impossible to achieve with prefabricated materials. And the first one of this type will be built with Pratt Institute next summer landscape and water infrastructures that take advantage of the solidity of the material to create topographic operations for gathering places and cultural events, small-scale structures that host educational programs for cultural institutions and that can be quickly built and dismantled, and structures for food production, where the earth bag also performs as a biological habitat. So in such cases, plants, fungi, and other small organisms can grow around the earth bags and become a skin that transforms and changes with the environment. Nevertheless, the earth bag is only one of multiple mediums and techniques through which our collective addresses issues of commonality. And so they also include exhibitions, pavilions, and housing and urban projects. Two of our current projects, for instance, include a pavilion for a design festival in Spain that recovers local spaces of storytelling and reconstructs them in the underused courtyard of the city library, and an urban proposal for the city of Oz that developed from our winning entry in the European competition. The first one of these projects reclaims the notion of the commons from a performative standpoint, reenacting moments of collective storytelling using existing spatial typologies, and the second one reclaims the notion of the commons using a participatory framework through the design of one board game that serves to promote public participation and that is actually currently being tested in Norway. We believe that such projects could lead towards a common practice of design where technique and process become a priority. And so we hope to provide inventive collective imaginaries that contribute to a common good. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Laura Valfiero, and I'm from the Advanced Architectural Design Program 2008. Um, so, established in 2009, Plus is a heterogeneous practice with international presence in the fields of architecture, urban planning, design, and consulting for the industry, working on different formats, scales, and geographies. We collaborate with disruptive clients and talented makers to conceive and activate spaces and conversations. We are an international architecture and design studio that is human-centric, with strong presence in New York, Sao Paulo, and Mexico City. At this studio, we have three main focuses. Um, the products, which are you know, product design of furniture and modular systems. The practice, which is the work directly with clients. And the research, um, where we have the curatorial work and experiments in multidisciplinary collaborations. The products, uh, which started as a natural demand from the clients for the project, a series of personalized items that range from workstations and benches to light furniture and art installations. This allows us to deal with a series of local craftsmen in a smaller scale, but one that possesses an entire different set of challenges. Experimenting with different materials and basic forms to create functional everyday objects from different purposes in the workplace, home, or the city. Our approach is anchored in the power of collaboration and the understanding of the built environment as a physical and cultural landscape with materials and social repercussions. Valuing research, functionality, and longevity over fashion we conceive spaces and products that authentically reflect our clients and their times, while providing them with a long-term response to their needs. Reacting to aspects of place, time, function, and client goals 
We place materials and methods of construction above formal assumptions. The studio aims to identify and employ relevant, relevant crafts and technologies through an ongoing research complemented by the build work, which provides a three-dimensional laboratory that cannot be represented through other methods. In this context, aspects like functionality and efficiency are given priority over design theory, ensuring a successful physical experience. For the Venice Biennale, we presented Walls of Air. For the Brazilian Pavilion, as a response to three space themes suggested by the Grafton architects. The exhibition attempts to uncover the visible and invisible walls that have built Brazil. It showcases several large scale maps that weave together a narrative of issues that affect not only Brazil, but also other countries in the Americas. And the question of scale here is crucial. To discuss urbanization, we have to look at multiple scales at once and explore their interdependencies. In this exhibition, we look at the architectural scale, the, the scale of cities, and the scale of the Brazilian territory at large. As we started to move between scales, we realized that the first wall we had to break was actually the one that separates architecture from the other disciplines. Our pavilion is the result of a collaboration with more than 200 professionals from 10 different disciplines. We put together a multidisciplinary committee, including lawyers, engineers, filmmakers, political theorists, indigenous activists, mathematicians, doctors, historians, environmentalists, geologists, and more than 20 artists. <laughs> Processing resources from an extended set of data from 2,000 sources such as the NASA, the Globus Forest Watch, satellites from Germany, France, England, and the U.S., and many more. These drawings we created embrace from the small scale of the physical walls that separate the public and the private domain, and that are felt in our daily lives, to the large scale of Brazil's territory and the invisible social and political walls that have shaped the reality of Brazilians today. And after all these experiences and conversations with clients and collaborators, we felt we needed something more personal and intimate. We felt that fierro, which means iron in English, is that connection between all these worlds and formats. Fierro, besides being a solid material, is also my last name. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, my name is Rajiv, and I graduated in 2010. From places and spaces to positive faces, Little Icon is here to draw attention. We are creating visual content designed to spark discourse and catalyze action. As an architect, my drawings were an instructional story of how to construct one's environment. As an illustrator, my drawings are a story to construct dialogue. From architecture, I learned it is the details that build up to a larger whole. A little icon, we boldly show the smallest sensibilities of the issues that are present in our social environment in order to have a larger conversation. I'm going to talk to you guys about a few of my projects. So my first woke piece was uh, Immigrant Lady Liberty. With the growing xenophobic rhetoric in our country, this image was meant to provoke a reaction, and it did. It opened up a dialogue about immigration, the hijab, women's rights, within Islam, and so on. I even received hate mail, probably usually from my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> but the overwhelming response was positive. It allowed people on both sides of the issue to have a constructive conversation. Here you can see it was featured in Posters for Change from Princeton Architectural Press, and that received a lot of big press, including uh, The Guardian and a full page spread in the Sunday edition of The Washington Post. This piece is called Light Out of Darkness, and it touches on multiple issues. Inspired by the Indian Festival of Lights, Diwali, we wanted to celebrate the advancement of LGBTQ rights and the growing Me Too movement in India. In our signature style, we are opening the door to shine light on the taboo issues. And since our medium is digital, it is fast pro to procure and easily shareable. So when I was a kid, one thing I really enjoyed was not thinking that I would get shot at school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Kind of 
As gun violence continues to be an epidemic in this country, we have to be loud and bold with our statements. On the left side, Law Icon partnered with Future Coalition, a parent group to youth advocacy groups like March for Our Lives and Walk Out to Vote. We did a social media series of shareable content pieces to get, your, to get youth vocal and active on Election Day 2018. On the right side is a self-produced sticker campaign to ask if the GOP has become complacent with gun violence in this country. We passed out over a thousand stickers in the March for Our Lives rally in DC, where we received a lot of high fives and a lot of raised eyebrows. <laughs> uh, one of my very right-wing Republican friends was like, gee, that's badass. I'm like, no, 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 no. So the success of it, though, was that people were forced to state their opinion on the issue, and this created a better understanding of someone else's view. So who here voted in New York City? Raise your hand. All right, this is not the sticker you get after voting, but it could have been. Uh, this placed third out of a 700 plus submissions in a contest for New York's new I Voted sticker, and I'm still pissed about not winning. Um, and so what we are doing here is we're involving the community in our work through crowd elected commissions. It's like a community board meeting, but for art. On the right is a submission for the new POPs logo that will adorn over 500 spaces in the city. We are thinking about how an icon image can represent multiple things, the rigidity of the buildings, the foliage of the landscape, and the overall icon of a public space. And finally, Lil Icon can never forget his architecture roots. We are taking our bold illustrations back into the built environment. I've partnered with Link NYC to be featured on their Art on Link series, and we're working on a set of images that deals with temporal space and the moving user. We've also been commissioned to do a large banner, it's a 10 foot by 45 foot piece, um, at the Immigrant Legal Center facade in Omaha. The past year at the incubator has been seen tremendous growth for Lil Icon, We've developed a business model of licensing agreements, commissions, and art direction. We did a rebrand from what started as a children's company to one of art for millennials by millennial. And while our name says little, our bold design, our voice, and our mission to draw attention to social issues and make the world a bit brighter remains big. Hello, my name is Marcella Del Signore. I graduated in 2017, uh, and I'm an architect, educator, and also the principal of Extopia. Uh, so one of the uh, main projects uh, this year at the Incubator has been the publication of uh, uh, Urban Machines, Public Space in a Digital Culture. So I will talk uh, briefly about the book, and then I will talk about a project that I'm currently building and developing in New Orleans. Um, so over the last few decades, uh, an increasingly uh, collaborative and interdisciplinary work has been developed between architects, artists, urban uh, and media designers that has defined a new landscape of projects that integrate the urban, technological, ecological, political and uh, social scale to engage information technology as a catalytic tool for expanding and altering public and social interaction in the public space. So the book itself uh, aims to present a critical historical overview of the impact of information technologies in public space, but also providing a vision for possible future scenarios uh, for the public realm and the digital culture. So the book is titled Urban Machines, as you can see, and so the first thing, so the, the book frames uh, urban machines as interventions that are physically plugged in in the uh, public and uh, urban space. Uh, but at the same time are a system that uh, function as a system and test relationship between what we call the city, the technology, and again the social scale. Um, environment, space, and technology are different forms uh, of use are intertwined to produce a space that encourages new modes of urbanity. And again, what's really one part of the research for the book is how we can uh, um, define new forms of public life. Uh, so in more detail, the book is divided in three parts, essay, case essays, case studies, and a conversation. The essay is divided in four uh, chapters that talk about how we can operate in the digital cities 
looking at interacting, integrating, expanding, hacking, and networking uh, as our, one of the five categories of investigation. The case study section represents an historical overview, so the project selected look back, you know, 15 years, 10, 15 years back. Um, and the project has been selected for the capacity of, again, catalyzing relationship between city, citizens, play, and technology. And the conversation section expands on several themes, including situated technology, data, participation, network, scenario planning, open source city, and more. So the book itself and the research that I'm currently doing and uh, I will continue to do after this book uh, in, the, in, in the PhD that I'm currently um, writing the dissertation. Uh, so the book itself expands on the local and global form of planetary scale computation, looking at how this affects public space and city life through the lens of developed urban prototypes. So all the projects developed, again, are small scale, but have the potential of impact in the city in the long term, looking at prototyping, replication, and long-term implementation. Uh, in conjunction with the book, uh, with the research developed for the book, uh, my practice at Stopia has tested over the last 10 years, built projects looking especially at the notion of urban machine. So what you see here is one of the projects that I'm currently developing. Uh, in New Orleans and is currently under construction. Uh, so this is part of a competition that I won in 2016 and is still under development. So on the left side you see the prototype that was built last year as a small testing device to again test a large scale. And data field is part of the New Orleans city strategy to, to, um, to see how cities can live with water and how, again, we can rebuild infrastructure to infrastructures through the lens of resiliency. Uh, so the project itself built on the rich history of topography and pumping, pumping stations and systems in this case. And the project becomes an inhabitable, responsive, three-dimensional map of the water infrastructure, looking at responsive systems and real-time data as well. Um, the video, yes? Uh, another one. Here we go, perfect. Uh, so data field, uh, again, as I said, is currently under construction, so I'm working with the city of New Orleans, different organization, and looks again at the water network of the city of New Orleans and uh, um, to establish a platform for citizens to share and communicate the challenges and opportunities to live with water. Um, so the project will open, hopefully, next year and will be one of the largest in-scale public urban placemaking intervention in New Orleans, uh, located along one of the main canals, the main water infrastructure, and will be part of the new uh, water master plan for the city. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Brennan, and uh, the project we worked on at our time at the GSAP Incubator is called Redo Terminal. Um, so, what is Redo Terminal? Uh, Redo Terminal is a digital finance tool that streamlines the real estate acquisitions process uh, by automating and optimizing traditional real estate modeling. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit, but it's an entirely web-based tool, which means that anyone with Chrome can log in and use it. Um, and it's a very, we, we try to make it a very streamlined and clean interface, which is a very far cry from the messy grasshopper definition that spawned this model. Uh, so we spent a lot of time sort of refining this really robust, crazy grasshopper optimization model down to something that was clean and easy to use. Um, so it originated actually as a service that we would uh, use for our architecture firm to one, try to help generate revenue, uh, but also try to use it almost as a business development tool, get these booklets out there, show people that we could understand real estate, we understood zoning, and uh, we understood uh, financial modeling. Um, it was actually conceptualized by uh, Mark Madera, who's uh, one of my partners on this project, and is also a GSAP alum, and, uh, School of Real Estate alum, and um, basically what we wanted to do was we realized that 
traditional real estate modeling was ripe for innovation, and a lot of the tools that they were using could easily be automated and optimized using Grasshopper and Galapagos and those sorts of tools. So we could recommend the highest and best use for a site instantly based on all the zoning data, all the financial data, and all the market data. Um, so we made the leap to decide to turn it into a product. Um, we, we got to the finals of the Columbia Venture Community Startup Competition, and a lot of our clients that we were talking to basically were telling us, this booklet is great, but I still I want to be able to use this tool myself. I, I don't want to have to call you and order the report and then wait for a week to run the report and print the booklet and give it to me. I want to be able to just test it out and within five minutes make a decision about whether or not it's worth pursuing. So we said, okay, we're going to build you guys a tool. Um, so based on a lot of initial user, uh, not even user, but potential client or potential user input, uh, we streamlined the interface. We gave them the flexibility to input their own values. So um, it's, it's not a prescriptive tool. We do recommend a solution, but we also give them the ability to override the data and determine their own solutions using our optimization engine. Um, and so we also wanted to make an Excel user-friendly interface. So this looks a little bit like Excel, and, and you can navigate through it like you would Excel, but there's a really powerful optimization engine and some visualization tools on the back end that make it a little bit more robust and um, help you get to the solution much faster. Um, so uh, what I really wanted to talk about was sort of how we progressed since we started at um, the, the Columbia Incubator. So at the top are some mock-ups for some of the visualization uh, changes we want to make to the interface, but also some additional features that we want to add. But one of the things that I think we learned um, since we launched our alpha program in January is that a lot of the things that we thought people wanted, they actually don't want. Um, so, <laughs> so getting things out into the hands of the users early, uh, I would have wished actually that we would have done it sooner. Uh, but so in addition to that, so we expanded from three properties to three zip codes, which is 6,500 properties in our database. And building out that database was a pretty pretty tough uh, task for us. We were also accepted to AlmaWorks, which is uh, an accelerator run by Columbia. It was an eight-week intensive uh, workshop every uh, once a week where we met with people um, and gave us a lot of feedback on our pitch and our business model and that sort of thing. Um, and then we also launched the Apple program, as I mentioned, in January. So right now what we're currently doing is we're refining features based on user feedback. So one of the major things we're getting is that our address search is very clunky and doesn't work that well. So that's like a major thing that we're working on resolving. So rather than building, building out some of these additional features that we thought people wanted, we realized we need a better address search feature. And also what we're doing is uh, strategically expanding our property database. So um, right now there are some manual aspects to that. So we want to pick neighborhoods and zip codes that people are actually looking for for real estate development rather than just um, you know randomly picking them. So that's where we're at. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you, everyone at the incubator. It was a great few months, and I think we learned a lot and made a lot of progress. So thank you. Hi, I'm Benedict Luet. Um, I have an architecture practice called Interval Projects, um, and today uh, I'm presenting a project that um, we worked on with a few collaborators uh, through the GSAP incubator uh, called Mutualisms Building Cooperative Practices in Design. Um, so Mutualisms is a platform of events, workshops, and media exploring the possibilities of cooperative models of ownership, decision-making, and income sharing for design practices. Um, so it starts from the idea uh, that collaboration is increasingly important in the design fields, but that the organizational structures and business models um, haven't uh, caught up to, to this evolution in the way that uh, design practice operates, um, and that they remain hier uh, hierarchical, um, rather than uh, finding ways to properly value and support um, new forms of collaboration. And so it's not a survey of cooperative practices, but a form of collaborative uh, production knowledge and tools uh, for rebuilding design practice. Um, and so we're looking at uh, ways that um, 
small design practices in this case in New York mostly, um, could be reorganized as worker-owned businesses um, with a more democratically uh, governed and um, uh, equally income-sharing uh, practices. Uh, so it started actually as an uh, attempt to cooperatize um, our three practices, um, Melissa, Niall, and Marlisa and I. Um, and uh, through that, um, we uh, found that we wanted to just, instead of really focusing on, on trying to make this work as a, a group of four, we decided to shift our focus um, to uh, bring in, to try to bring in other people into this project. And so that's where Mutualism as a project came out of this attempt to first kind of look uh, in, within this group for how to cooperatize our practices. And then instead of, of pursuing that, we decided to create this platform uh, where we could engage other people in these discussions. Um, and so we've been working on uh, three series within this project. Uh, one's called Mutual Friends, which is a series of meetups, um, people who are working in the city uh, at a particular point in their practice that you know is more or less similar to us, where they have some projects, um, but they uh, you know are, are looking for ways to, to grow their practice um, and want to meet up and talk about work in progress. Uh, the second is a series of workshops um, where a particular question about uh, design practice and how it could be uh, transformed into a, a cooperative uh, practice uh, to be explored. And the third is a series of uh, video Skillshare um, um, videos that we're, we're working on now. Uh, the first piece that we launched was Mutual Friends. Um, so the idea of this is that, and the graphic um, is like not a closed event, but it's a word of mouth event where whatever happens is, uh, you know, stays in the room. Um, we want it to be something where there's a lot of trust that's being built, uh, where people are comfortable sharing work that is not fully worked out. Um, so uh, these, you know, we've done uh, three of these this spring. Uh, we felt they were really uh, successful, got a lot of good feedback on it. And we're now actually starting to organize uh, the next round of these. Um, and part of the idea of the project is really that it is a relatively open um, uh, platform. So if any of you want to help co-organize the next round of these with us, uh, please let me know, because part of the idea is that it does continue to grow, um, that it's, it's something where uh, even if it starts with us, it, it continues to sort of radiate out. Um, so we're, we're interested in working with other people on um, the next round of these events and the workshops. Um, and yes, yeah, so thank you to, to David and Augustine for the opportunity to do this. And it really did grow out of the last round of the incubator. Niall Greenberg and Marlies and I were both in the previous session of the incubator, and that's sort of where this idea of reorganizing our practices cooperatively uh, came out of that. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Tasting, tasting. <laughs> Twice. I'm Andre Haurugi. Um, this is Haley Ramos, and we are SOE Studio, the first practice in New York City dedicated to developing and implementing digital tech for advancing historic preservation. Our focus during our time at the incubator has been to push the boundaries of the field and to establish our professional practice as an experimental studio. Today we'll be presenting some of the projects we have completed and are currently working on. What you're seeing now are some recent 3D models from photogrammetric scans of Aztec and Mayan artifacts, which are currently located at the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Photogrammetry scans like this are just one example of the type of digital documentation work we do. So at the beginning of this year, we finished designing and developing an augmented reality application for the San Baudelio Hermitage in Spain. This is a video that will show our app in action, and it basically overlays paintings that were once situated on the monument's walls and were removed and now exist on canvas at various locations around the world. 
and the app will be available for download in May and it can be used on site by visitors. And if you're interested in learning more, check out our website at www.soe.studio. We're implementing a similar approach for a current AR project, which will be available this fall at the old Essex County Jail in the city of Newark, which is now a ruin. Our practice has grown from completing small-scale projects focused on individual objects and building elements to large-scale projects that capture entire sites. We use the latest scanning technologies to create as-built drawings, as well as facilitate adaptive reuse of historic structures. Over the past two months, we've been using these digital tools to document a historical landmark in New Canaan, Connecticut. From the scanning data, we are able to create a 3D model and as-built drawings of the site that we will use in a later phase um, of the project to design an upcoming exhibition that will be open this fall. In addition to scaling up, our studio's work has evolved beyond just the digital, and we've just begun the research phase of a design-build project restoring a historic home in New Mexico using tax credits. Built in 1927, the home is in the Southwest vernacular style and is located in the Silver Hill Landmark District in Albuquerque. We're using the uh, digitization methods to assist with our efforts of preserving the structure. These are just some historic photographs uh, from different contributing buildings to the district, and these images will help inform our design and preservation decisions for our own project. We recognize that preservation practice could greatly benefit from emerging tech, and we have continued to work with the historic preservation program here at USAP teaching workshops and giving uh, lectures on scanning methods. <laughs> Additionally, while at the incubator, we have formed interdisciplinary collaborations with alumni and current members. We work with Bika Rebeck and her class in the CCCP program, presenting our work on digital and physical replication. We also just finished an excited, exciting project with uh, fellow members Farzine and Caitlin at the United Nations, a continuation of the project Modern Management Methods. This is a photogrammetry model of the United Nations Security Council conducted during our field work. The space was a vital location for their x-ray scans. And we used 750 high resolution photos and were able to begin to process and produce this 3D model that you're looking at now. We look forward to continuing our collaboration with GSAP, uh, faculty, alumni, and we look forward to sharing some more of our exciting work soon. And we'd like to thank Augustine and the space as well. the last ones. Uh, I'm Greta Haidt Hansen. And I'm Sean Wolfgang Rofi, and we are Wolfgang and Haidt. I'm going to uh, briefly summarize our working practice prior to GSAP. Um, like many firms, we started as a couple, and then we became business partners. Our first collaboration was turning our one bedroom apartment into a two bedroom for guests with a top hinged trundle bin. Um, in 2015, I founded a construction company which specialized in art and fashion renovations and build-outs, and Greta would often consult on these projects, um, like this uh, apartment renovation we did for an art collector who wanted a lot more light to show off her paintings. Um, we started uh, coordinating, fabricating, constructing, and installing large-scale art installations for Red Bull Studios in Chelsea, um, like this uh, installation for Nick Lobo and Ryder Rips. And we also worked with a number of artists, um, like Fong Boy. And uh, we also did their expansive uh, gift shop, and then uh, their offices in Greenpoint. Um, one of my favorite projects in our early collaboration was this limited edition Red Bull cocktail in a box. Uh, that's coming up. There she is. Uh, the solid walnut box is designed uh, to have specialty cocktails by their famous mixologists as a uh, promotional tool. Um, in 2016, we started working, uh, our collaborators with the artist team, uh, Jonah Freeman and Justin Lowe, and we started um, designing, building, and installing their crazy exhibitions all over uh, the country and in Europe, uh, Istanbul. Uh, and our most uh, 
extensive one was this 6,000 square foot bunker in Cleveland, Ohio, um, where we recreated a natural history museum uh, that we fabricated from pretty much scratch and designing like these wood ceiling elements. And then uh, our last project prior to uh, GSEP was this um, submission for the Van Allen competition, uh, the holiday design. Um, and this is a restaurant, this is another collaboration with uh, the artists Freeman and Lowe, um, which we completed last year. Um, and since then we've been really busy. Um, many of you have actually noticed probably <laughs> us working away and spreading out a lot and growing in numbers. Um, and we've really used the space, like seriously used it. We're super <laughs> grateful um, to everybody in it and behind it. Um, and so the following projects, we have all, we've started them all and some of them completed in the last seven months, which have gone by quickly. Um, this is a, um, a restaurant called Violet in the East Village, which we finished uh, last fall. And it's on 5th and A, and they have very greasy pizza, which is called Rhode Island style. Um, uh, a lot of our work um, has been collaborative. Uh, this is a team effort with an architecture firm called AB Architectin, um, and it's a concept for a nature resort, hotel, and spa in upstate New York um, in a location not disclosed. Um, we also um, put the tree out. Um, we also collaborated with um, a designer named Celia Emery on uh, this renovation for the Harlem School of the Arts, which is a nonprofit art center. And um, we worked also on this competition for Monument Avenue in Richmond to rethink the statuary along um, Monument Avenue. We proposed to actually lower the statues into pools that are sized by the um, circumference of the pedestals. So visitors peer down at them instead of looking up at them um, and let time and water do what it will. Um, this is a restaurant um, ceiling installation uh, in Nashville called uh, Pemrose Park. And that name comes from a Shel Silverstein poem uh, that has an octopus next to it. So we're hoping that this ceiling kind of combines uh, a rose and tentacles. And um, lastly, this is a shoe and clothing store called Wish in Atlanta. Um, and the concept behind this was to bring the form of ductwork down to the floor. And that's the basement. <laughs> Thank you.